just before we go into the panelists, I just wanted to frame for you a little bit the thinking behind this panel. So natural capital, well, what is it really? Well, for a business, it's really about understanding environmental externality costs. So the costs of doing business that has impacts on the environment, whether it's greenhouse gas emissions, use of water, use of land, generation of pollutants and waste. And it's understanding the full economic cost of that. This issue is becoming more and more urgent for business and particularly investors to understand in light of things like resource constraints, more erratic weather conditions that we see associated with climate change, for example, flooding. So all these things are putting constraints on the system and on our current business models. So in the panel today, we're going to explore some of those things. First of all, we're going to look at the business case for natural capital accounting. And in TEEP for Business Coalition, we have commissioned uh, TrueCost to conduct a study called Natural Capital at Risk. And for those of you who were at the session earlier today on financing green growth, this was referred to. And this really spells out the business case on this issue. So we're going to talk to the authors, True Cost, today about that. We're also going to explore what businesses here in India are doing on natural capital and what businesses internationally are doing. And then finally, we're going to look at the policy context and see some of the enabling conditions that policymakers are starting to put in place to facilitate action in business. So I'd like to start with our first panelist. That's Ramesh Kamal. Ramesh, if we could start with thinking about the Indian business context. What do you see as the key activities that Indian business are doing on natural capital? Thank you, Dorothy, and uh, welcome to all of you. See, I have been in the wind turbine business for the last uh, 20 years, and I have seen this sector grow from almost zero base to where we are today, which is number four in the world. And with the uh, constraints that we have in India for natural capital. Uh, we are all surprised why we have so much of resistance for renewable energy to grow in India. Really speaking, renewable energy should be a no-brainer because it does not use uh, uh, fossil fuels, it does not even use water, especially wind does not even use water. So why is it that we have this problem? And when you look deep into it, the problem is the problem of uh, skewed subsidies for fossil fuels. Why should a non-renewable resource be so cheap compared to a uh, renewable uh, resource? So this is something which the policymakers and we have been pushing the policymakers to look at. Looking at the Indian uh, uh, you know, business, why is it that they have invested in wind power? People say it is due to tax breaks. Really speaking, not. Most of the investors are people who have been using the electricity for their own captive requirements. The uh, industries which use a lot of electricity for their production, which means that a good portion of their final cost of product is electricity. People like textile, cement, steel, etc. Now, uh, so this is one way of. Uh, you know, by doing that, we are conserving the natural capital uh, uh, in, in the country, but that is not good enough because it is coming as a spin-off to the main activity. What we need to do is to really push the policy to make sure that the external, externality costs are coming in and therefore making it even more uh, viable. Just an example to tell you, do you know that there are no subsidies for coal or oil in Sri Lanka or in Pakistan? And Sri Lanka, the cost of electricity is 52 rupees per kilowatt hour, and we are paying only 3 or 4 rupees. 52 Sri Lankan rupees, which is 26 Indian rupees. But still, we are way off. So we have to get real in this world. Thank you. Are doing in 
Ganesha, our main line of activity is wind turbine generators of uh, very high efficiency, which are grid connected. And as a kind of a CSR activity, we started with wind, solar, uh, small wind, solar, hybrid systems, which are off-grid connected. Then we found that there's a huge opportunity to make use of that uh, technology for our rural India, where most villages are not connected to electricity, even though on paper they are electrified. There is no electricity. There is a mobile um, communication tower in every village, but there is no electricity. So uh, this system actually can also purify water, which is required for a small village, and supply electricity in the evening hours, and also uh, uh, you know, electrify the uh, communication tower during the time when there is sun and when there is wind. So this is something which we are rolling out in the um, uh, rural areas for distributed generation. So that's, again, something which we are taking as a mainline activity for Gameta. Thank you so much, Ramesh. And I'd like to move on now to Richard Matheson. Richard, as I said at the beginning, is the CEO of TrueCost. And you won't find any more copies of this report outside, but you can download it at the Team for Business Coalition website. TrueCost yesterday launched this report called Natural Capital at Risk, the Top 100 Externalities <coughs> of Business. Sorry. It's really got some very important information in it for business. Richard, would you be able to take us through some of the key findings in that report? Sure. Um, can everybody hear me, first of all? Is this microphone working on? Should, is this better? The second one. Okay, second, second one. Okay, okay great. Um, well, basically, the, the report outlines, as Dorothy mentioned, uh, the extent to which we're using or overusing our natural capital, upon which we rely on to create other forms of capital, like financial capital. And the headline statistic really is that if you take together global primary production and processing, that's primary processing, the um, natural capital amounts to 7.3 trillion. Um, and if you distill that down to the top 100 environmental externalities, that is 4.7 trillion US dollars. So those are big numbers. What do they actually mean? Um, well, just to put them into context, in 2007 and 8, during the global financial crisis, um, the pension funds in the developed world um, their combined losses amounted to 5.4 trillion US dollars. So we're dealing with a risk around the same size as the global financial crisis that we've just gone through and are continuing to go through globally. Um, and just a little bit about how we actually put those numbers together. Essentially what we did was we priced um, nature according to things like scarcity and we priced environmental damages according to how much we're actually paying for it. So, for example, with air pollution, if you uh, look to China and air pollution in Beijing, we saw yesterday that the level of air pollution went to 755 on a scale of 0 to 500 in January. Um, and the cost of that is quite close to around 10% of China's GDP. So that's, that's due to health costs, it's due to loss of crop uh, yield, um, and it's also due to the acidification of waterways, which has a whole host of other effects. If you go to water, um, essentially what we did was we priced water according to how scarce it was. And you would imagine if the, a market had that information about how scarce water was, then it would be priced that way. The problem is there's actually a negative correlation today in the price between the price of water and how scarce it is, which means we're encouraging the use of water in places where it's actually quite scarce. So in a sense, what we did was we put a price on uh, the, the things we actually rely on to create financial capital. And we compared that with um, what the impact would be on various different business sectors. And in many cases, it would wipe out not just the profit, but the entire productivity, the revenue of those sectors. So really what we're doing is we're, we, we are continuing to overuse resources, continuing to, to pollute, and we're doing that in ways that have a real financial implication for our, our global economy. So Richard, then, if you're a business, like here in the room today, or you're an investor who's investing in business, 
What should you be concerned about from this study? So, really, what we found a lot of businesses doing so far is doing a natural capital assessment of their business. And that includes looking at uh, the supply chain, looking at what customers do, and looking at your own operations. And that really means putting a price on risk. So, really, this happens in many other instances. You know, you would put a price on uh, uh, an interrupted supply of raw material. You might look at forecasting the price of uh, commodities, for example, if you're a business. This is no different. This is another piece of information that should feed into your business decision making and should sit on the risk register um, if it's material. Um, and so we're finding a lot of businesses um, using this type of analysis to think about, um, for example, how much more they're going to have to pay for raw materials if water were priced for those soft commodities, for example. Think about how much more they would have to pay for a product if China taxed air pollution which is highly likely. Um, and so a lot of businesses are, are using it to look at risk. They're also using it to look at opportunity because the opportunity is actually the difference between a business as usual scenario that we're currently on and the great work that a lot of companies are doing as per their CSR and sustainability initiatives. So, for example, Puma earlier this year announced a whole new range of products that were around a third better for the planet. And these products had been assessed according to these criteria used in this report. And interestingly, those products don't cost any more to produce, and they don't cost any more to the consumer, to the, the customer of Puma, but they are a third better for the planet. So I think there's both a risk analysis, and there's also the identification of opportunity. And finally, for investors, what we're doing is we're finding a lot of investors um, looking at uh, pension funds are using this, these types of techniques to identify the potential future liabilities associated with their portfolio and their investments. We're finding development banks using it to um, measure the benefit of their investments. And we're finding uh, index providers building new index products. So for example, we've worked with Standard & Poor's to develop an emerging markets index um, with the IFC. Uh, and we're also finding fund managers identify where their assets might potentially be stranded according to uh, if, you, if, if those, those companies uh, did have to pay uh, for their environmental externalities, would they still be in business? And so there's a whole raft of different applications. Excellent. Thank you so much, Richard. And I'd like to move on now to M.R. Ranjaswamy, the founder of the Corporate Eco Forum. And MR, you've been working in Corporate Eco Forum with companies already on this topic and running the Natural Capital Initiative. Can you tell us about that? Sure. Uh, is my mic working? I think it is, right? Yes? OK. OK. I'll leave this alone. Okay. Uh, so we started the Corporate Eco Forum in the United States seven years ago. And it's a membership organization of about 75 large multinational companies iconic brand names like Coca-Cola or Disney, Ford, Nike, Google, etc. And these are large companies who have come together to share best practices, innovations, and next practice around green and sustainability. So that's kind of the, the context of the EcoForum itself. Now within that, we created something called the Natural Capital Initiative that Dorothy just mentioned. This idea got started in 2011 when we were talking to the Clinton Global Initiative, or CGI, which is a major organization in the US, that gets organizations to make commitments on different initiatives that they take on. So they partnered with us and the Nature Conservancy to do something around valuing natural capital. And what it meant for us is, uh, when we made our commitment, we said there'd be three things that uh, we want to get done with this initiative. One, to get a critical mass of early movers, uh, companies, that get a grasp on what the true cost of natural capital is, i.e. water, land, forest, et cetera. Second, to get leaders within those companies to start articulating what it means to their business. It's not a CSR initiative like Ramesh said, it becomes a business initiative. And then the final thing was to really get this, uh, put a platform together that's led by business to scale out uh, the deployment of natural capital initiatives across industry. So those were the criteria behind it. So we started in 2011, and then in 2012 at the Rio Earth Summit uh, in June of last year, we were able to announce that 24 companies 
had gotten together, and these represent about 500 billion in total revenue. So these are large organizations who all made commitments to uh, this whole area of natural capital. And this was one of the few transformational activities that happened at the, at the Earth Summit. So it was a great start for us because these are projects, uh, I'll get into this a little bit later in, in terms of examples of these projects, but this was the first start where companies came together, shared ideas, and did something in collaboration. So it was a good start, but then we started thinking, you know, how much more do we need to get? Because everybody talks of scaling these things. So what we decided to do in 2012 September, again at the Clinton Global Initiative, was to expand our commitment and take this global. So now we're looking for companies like yourselves here in the audience in India, in Australia, in Mexico, and different parts of the world to come on and join the 24 companies who've already been on board. And then together, what we're going to do is to take this to Davos next year in January. That's the goal that uh, Dorothy, I know we work in collaboration with you as well, is to bring it to the World Economic Forum in January and truly make this a global issue where world leaders, CEOs, NGOs all get together and decide to work on this as a global initiative. So that's kind of the end game. And so what we're looking for is a next set of companies at this point. And in Davos, we want to really get together and make this a global issue. So that's kind of the context of how we have launched this with our member companies. Excellent. Thank you, Anar. And thinking of the work that you've done, can you give us one or two examples of, of companies and exactly the steps that they took? Sure. So one of the things we did was, as you realize, our member companies are very diverse. They represent 20 different industries. So there's no one way to kind of categorize all these companies. So we came up with the nine-step uh, action framework. Again, this report that we've done, uh, in order to be sustainable, we have this online. You can get this at the ecoforum.com website. It's called uh, the Natural Capital Initiative uh, Imperative. Uh, and so that report outlines a nine-step uh, framework. The first step, uh, like uh, Richard, you mentioned, is to assess yourself. You know, how do you do this? How do you know where you are uh, in using raw materials and natural capital ecosystems and so forth? That's the first step. So you could use reports like what Richard has done, uh, WRI. Uh, Andrew Steer was here yesterday. They've come up with a new corporate ecosystem valuation tool that's available. So there are lots of tools that you can utilize to assess yourself. The second thing is to put a price on nature. And this is where you talked about Puma and PPR, actually undertaking a P&L and a balance sheet to really come up with how they put a, a price on nature. So that's the second step. The third step is to optimize and use less of nature itself. Now, for example, Clorox is one of our member companies who's restoring watersheds by taking an approach of water reduction, recapture, and restoration. So again, taking a look at some of the resources that their customers or their consumers use in order to use Clorox's products and to lower that. Uh, step number four is to actually invest in conservation and forests. Uh, companies like Disney, Marriott, TD Bank, they've all made strategic investments in, in restoring forest and forest land. The next one is to engage your value chain and, and the resources that you use. Coca-Cola, for example, is doing a lot of work in making their water usage net zero. Uh, that's one of the big projects that they are undertaking, and this is an initiative that's rolling across the 900 facilities or bottling plants that they have. The other one is to uh, innovate and process this in materials. One of our members is Haynes Brands. They make uh, underwear and, and T-shirts. What they've done is they've tried to find flax as a substitute raw material to cotton. Flax uses less water and is easier to grow. So they're now substituting flax as a raw material to some of their products. So that's another case of valuing nature and finding a substitute. Uh, another one is to use natural infrastructure instead of man-made infrastructure. For example, companies that use effluents usually like to put a water system in place to clean up the water, table, uh, water that they use. A couple of our members, uh, Dow Chemical and Alcoa, took a different approach. Their fa facilities happen to be located next to marshland and wetlands. So instead of putting up a water cleaning facility, which would cost them literally $50 million, they were actually able to save money by using these marshlands as a natural filtration system. 
and it only costs them about a million dollars to do this. So again, use nature, and the filtration system is available in nature as opposed to building a water treatment facility. So that's another way to do it. And then leveraging capital markets and investment tools. For example, FEMSA is one of our members in Mexico. They've set up a water fund for Latin America where uh, communities can come get money from them and clean up water tables and water systems. This is not directly impact, impacting FEMSA, but it's impacting the communities they work in. And then the final step is to really join forces, and that's what the EcoForum is all about, is working with Clinton Global Initiative, with the TNC, the you know, Nature Conservancy, working with TEEB, and all these other organizations to come together as a group, as a coalition, and take this message on to a global scale. So that's kind of some examples and how our nine-step framework is put in place. Thank you so much, Amar. It's fantastic to get examples and also good news examples of, of how this can be used to a business's opportunity. And I'd like to move on now to Partha Sangupta. Partha, you're from Tata Steel. What is Tata Steel doing in terms of managing its natural capital? Uh, let me start. As the name suggests, we are involved in the making of steel. So we convert uh, natural resources like iron ore and coal, use it and we convert it and make uh, steel, which is used for variety of infrastructure and goods and services that you see around. <coughs> At the outset, what I wanted to mention was that uh, India is a growing economy. And so therefore, uh, there is a need for steel or need for growth for infrastructure and several other things that actually needs steel. As a result of which, the consumption of steel is, of course, indicated to have a sharp growth. And in India, it is growing at the rate of almost uh, 10 percent, 7 to 10 percent, depending on how the economy is doing. Now, if that is the situation, and if that is the requirement of the country, then obviously the consumption of steel has to move up as we move along. Steel is a, a resource intensive industry. I think we must all understand that, that it requires raw materials, it requires water, it requires a lot of uh, additives as we move along, converts all of it, and then produces the product. So the whole uh, idea of trying to work on steel industry is to find out ways and means, firstly, of consuming less and consuming uh, inferior grades of material into this conversion process. When the steel industry started several years ago, I think uh, we, we used to use the best of iron ore and the best of coal for the conversion and convert them into steel. But as time has gone by and it is going to go ahead in the future, while the demand of steel doesn't go down, the occurrence of such material is, through mother nature is obviously in a diminishing cycle. So therefore, one of the first things that is to do is to figure out how lesser, uh, let's say lower grade of material can actually be used in this process of conversion. And with that, Tata Steel has invested heavily in terms of trying to find out ways and means of using lower grade or inferior grades of both iron ore and coal in its conversion processes. So that, that it's a twofold purpose. One is to use more of what you have rather than throwing it away as waste. And the second thing is to make our processes more efficient so that we are able to convert and sustain at still competitive costs so that we are able to compete in the world as some of the, along with the, some of the best steel makers. The other idea is that steel is a resource, uh, highly resource intensive and it consumes a lot of water and a lot of other resources as I mentioned. So therefore, the whole process is around trying to figure out how do we use less of water, how do we use less of other additives that are required in the, in the process of steel making. So we have continuously converted our processes to see that we are almost what we call as a zero discharge plant. So that means all the water that is taken in is recycled and used within the plant itself so that our makeup water is minimized. Water, as you know, in India, fresh water is, under, is, is not a very easily available uh, commodity. Secondly, I think India is also largely agrarian-based industry. 
So, therefore, always there is a competition between industry and agriculture and therefore, it is one of the conflicts that we see going ahead in future with reducing fresh water supply as we see whether it is a ground table or whether it is the catchment or rainfall. So, therefore, one of the major thrusts is to find out how do we use less of water. The third area that we work on is on the area of effluents. It produces a lot of CO2, carbon dioxide gases, because it uses carbon. And then, of course, there is other effluents, sludge, waste, etc. So, we have found many uses, many ways of how to make use of such waste products. One of the important ways that we do is, for instance, a natural byproduct of steel making, of iron making, is what is called a slag. The slag is used for the making of cement, and it is now a natural process. Power industry, which supports steel, also goes into the cement industry for the making of cement. We use the sludge for making bricks for our own construction and all these kind of buildings that we have around, so that we are able to reuse this. Of course, while the, uh, while the focus is always to reduce, but the focus is also on reuse, so that we are able to use, use more of this, more of the waste material, and we minimize effluence, minimize pollution and minimize wastage and minimize the impact of our factories and mines on the society around. The last thing that I wanted to mention was also <coughs> there is a lot in designing of the steel product for the, for the markets. Progressively, you have to make do with less to, produ to get more. So, that means that we produce more and more high strength steels, more and more high grades of steel. So, that if earlier, if we had to use a ton of steel for a particular project, we try and figure out how to, how to do with half of that. And we have found considerable progress and we have put in considerable amount of research to find how to find out ways and means by which we are able to make these new grades of steel, so that it uses less steel. And therefore, if you move it down the value chain, you naturally use more less, lesser of natural resources in the whole process. So, that is how the whole, whole integrated steam by which we work right from the mines, where we extract the minerals and right till the place where we go to the customer and teach them how to use kind of lighter steels, but those which are stronger with the same finished products. Parta, thank you so much. And now, we are going to move the conversation on to the policy side and look at the policy context. Ravi Sharma. Principal Officer with UN Convention on Biodiversity. Can you tell us about some of the enabling policies that could help businesses move forward on natural capital management that, that are coming in on the policy side? Um, thank you. Well, um, it's, it's very good to hear all these sort of voluntary initiatives which are very positive coming from the industry side. Um, also to recognize that you know, policy making even at the international level, is a pretty slow-moving process. Um, the treaty which you're talking about now, signed by 193 parties, um, so almost universal except um, some few, few countries, of course, uh, U.S. being one of those which has not signed it. Um, but it, it was agreed in 1992 um, in Rio. And it's now 2013, and, and uh, it's taken a long time to spread the awareness about the importance of um, the natural capital, which we are all talking about, and the value of it. So it has taken a lot of time for governments, first of all, to recognize what to do, which I believe has been well recognized. They have set up targets on what needs to be done and by period which this needs to be achieved. And these are very comprehensive targets which were agreed um, two years ago in, in Nagoya in Japan. And these are 20 targets which looks not only at the loss of biodiversity but also goes further down and looks at what are the drivers of these losses and some of the drivers which have been mentioned in some of the examples here. Um, but still, the, the question is uh, how to achieve these targets. 
and who needs to play what role is, is still very challenging and very complex. So as an international treaty, I think it's a very good um, thing for businesses, which are more and more global today, because it does create a level playing field for businesses to operate globally by having these international regulations. Um, but how to now get down to the national level where businesses which still have a significant amount of impact on biodiversity through their operations needs to integrate these concerns into their own operational plans, into their daily activities, still remains a huge challenge. And uh, so that's what, what the treaty is all about. Now, um, there had also been a little concern within the governments um, until very recently on how much engagement do they want from businesses on this. Because when you talk about biodiversity, you talk about a lot of issues which are related to land management. And uh, when you talk about land management, uh, there are issues about rights of local people, especially indigenous communities and local communities. And uh, there is always government variedness, whether involving businesses into this at an early stage would create and, and increase these conflicts in future. And to, so until 2006, when uh, we had one of the meetings in Brazil, um, the issue of engagement of business in biodiversity was not even agreed among the parties. It was only basically through the initiative of Brazil at that time that the issue started getting discussed. And since then and until now, 2013 and uh, last year, the, the meeting was held in India and in Hyderabad. There's a lot of progress which has been made because governments have realized two things. One, that businesses have a lot of influence on how biodiversity is going to be preserved in the future through their positive as well as negative actions. And so they need to be engaged and made aware of. And secondly, the governments also realize that the amount of resources financial and human, which are required to move the economy into um, a direction which is more positive for biodiversity than negative. Um, private capital is, is going to be a very essential component. And um, in the last two years, um, the, 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 the convention came up with two studies which were basically done under the convention guidance on what kind of resources would be required, financial resources for correcting this anomaly or bringing these externality into, into, into being. And uh, these two studies, especially one is very focused on, on the financial mechanism of the convention, which is global environment facility, but the other was one was global. It came up with huge numbers, of course. It came up with numbers which range from 130 billion to 430 billion of uh, investments required every year for the next 10 years, out of which at least 60 to 70 percent will be one-off investments, but the rest of the investments would be more recurring investments. Now, of course, these are very big numbers, and they can be sort of you know demoralizing in one sense, but if one looks at uh, the amount of global subsidies which are provided, they range from one to two trillion dollars. So some of this investment which one is talking about are investments which needs to be basically reform of the current subsidies into converting into incentives for, for biodiversity, which is what is required. So it's just not that the money which is required is, is completely impossible to achieve, but uh, obviously there is a lot of political will uh, which is required. Now, specifically coming down to uh, the mechanisms which the government has been um, thinking about um, internationally to engage businesses, there are what is referred to as, um, in the sort of convention jargon, as uh, innovative mechanisms. They're not necessarily innovative because they have been in existence in in some countries for quite some time. 
And these are the kind of mechanisms which governments are looking at promoting to engage the private sector more. These could be on engaging private sector through what is very commonly known as payment for ecosystem services. Um, there could be mechanisms related to uh, biodiversity offsets, which is, which is not very similar to, to the mechanism which we have in, in climate change. And of course, uh, fiscal reforms, uh, which could then convert subsidies into incentives for biodiversity. But before doing that, it is very clear that um, there needs to be safeguards, which needs to be created here. Safeguards which will ensure that um, the rights of local communities and indigenous people will be protected. And there will also be no further environmental consequences of actions taken specifically on, on biodiversity. And, and I think this is a very important um, aspect of the work which the convention has taken because it will um, make everything very clear for all the stakeholders who participate in it. Ravi, thank you so much. And I'd like to introduce our final panelist. Hem Pande. Hem Pande is the additional secretary at the Ministry of Environment and Forests. Wonderful to have you here. Can you tell us what the ministry's view is on natural <coughs> capital management here in India? Little technical hitch. Thank you. Hello. Can you hear me now? Yeah. That's better. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, well, uh, uh, you know, uh, if I talk about government, if I talk about Ministry of Environment and Forest, if I talk about uh, valuation of natural resources, investment on natural capital, I think so far. Uh, not only in India, I guess everywhere, whatever investments, whatever awareness is there is mainly on part of government. You know, governments are investing on, on preserving natural resources, whatever the world has. And, and uh, yesterday in the opening uh, uh, session, I had mentioned that in spite of huge biotic pressure, uh, in, a, in a country like India, I mean, if we compare ourselves with Brazil and China, uh, in India, in a, in a small area, geographical area, two and a half percent, we are housing eight percent of the world's biodiversity. It must have been either because of the governments or because of the people who are traditionally of, uh, uh, you know, uh, they have been dependent on the natural resources and they know the value of natural resources and, 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 and they have been conserving it. The larger corporations, yes, you know, as part of their corporate social responsibility, they have been voluntarily doing a bit. So, so we, we, we are realizing, apart from uh, giving permission to use forest area for non-forest purposes, we are realizing a value out of it, which you know, uh, corporations are paying, and it's one of the largest, uh, um, you know, uh, offset program. And uh, we have a total kitty of around uh, around uh, five billion dollars on this uh, so far, and we are going to utilize it for uh, you know uh, conservation uh, uh, purposes. Uh, CBD has taught us three things. One is conservation. One is sustainable use of the resources, you know, sustainable use of resources. So meaning thereby you use it sustainably and also non-use is also wrong. So, you know, so and many of us think that, you know, so, so non-use also has to come into play. I mean, we must use it sustainably. And third pillar, which is missing so far, is access and benefit sharing. The, 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 the corporations, the, the world, I mean, the whosoever is using those resources, they must plow back a very small, I mean, a small amount of whatever is possible back to the people who are, back to the areas who are engaged in conservation of those resources. This is very important. Unfortunately, this pillar, the third pillar, is yet to be realized globally. India is unique. We have, a, we have an act in place, 
Act of 2002, Bio Biological Diversity Act. Within the country, the access, the access and benefit sharing mechanism is already in place. We have 100 plus cases where uh, the, uh, the companies or the people or the you know, organizations who have access the resources, they are, uh, you know, as uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of mutually agreed terms, uh, they are plowing back a bit of money back to the business. So that has already started in the country, and we are looking forward as president of the conference of parties to the CBD. India is looking forward that this law, the Nagoya Protocol, becomes a global law, and this will be an important mechanism which you know then then the valuation process will get further philip you know uh, one would realize that you know the if you really get into it uh, so this you know once it starts working globally i guess interest in valuation of nature will you know even be more pronounced because you know uh, you know economics uh, you know the you know ecology is a study of the house you know, then the study of the house will be more pronounced because you know you will have to manage it, manage the way the economist looks at. You know, the whole 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 process of valuation is what bringing ecology and an ecologist and economist together. You know, together so that we go for the social, you know, the so, the sociology part of it. You know, and then the entire the sustainable development three pillars, uh, sociology, ecology, and economics all will. I mean, this whole exercise is that. India, we have we have couple of examples. A like investment on mangroves. You know, mangroves. I think all of us realized with the tsunami in uh, you know this uh, the, the first decade of this millennium, the tsunami came, and then we, uh, then one realized that you know the, the the protection that the protection that mangroves gave to the to the coastal areas was immense. I mean, I mean, if you, I, I don't know whether whether the valuation has started and will be ever, you know, the 24 ecosystem services that natural capital gives us, I don't think we'll be, we'll ever be able to value it. Like, like, you know, like, uh, if you want to control nature, uh, I, I don't think that that is going to be possible. Similarly, if we want to value all 24 services or maybe many more, you know, in, in terms of the, the way the economist looks at, I, I don't think it's possible. But we can always identify the value of the timber, identify the value of the, you know, soil formation, uh, the hydrological cycle, or, or the protection that mangroves provide. Government of India annually spends a lot of money on protection of the mangroves. We have around 7,000 uh, kilometers of shoreline. Uh, we have 5,000 square kilometers area under mangroves, and the area under mangroves is growing, and it's all uh, investment by the government alone. So this is where uh, the, you know businesses can come uh, form conservation partnership and 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 come together, and and uh, and the valuation, the protection that mangroves gives, I think no no artificial barrier is going to uh, provide that kind of cooperation. We learned in, in Loktak Lake in Manipur. In Manipur, we, we found out that if we are getting uh, one buck out of the hydrological, the, 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 the hydro power plant there, uh, if we protect the species around, protect the lake water and, and you know, uh, all that, we will earn four bucks out of the same lake. You know, that, that realization has given us to, to make policy change, you know. As against one buck, we are going to get four buck if we save that lake. Uh, another example is in Odisha, uh, the lake Chilika Lake is a huge water body. We, you know, about about uh, two hundred thousand fishermen are dependent on this directly, and we saw that the, the fish catch is growing down, going down. You know, it had it had come down to one thousand tons. It had come down to one thousand tons. Ultimately, ultimately, we had to we had to use practices which are sustainable. We had to make an intervention where we can save this lake. And lo and behold, we found that the fish catch has gone uh, multiple times, and the income from that uh, you know water body, which only on one resource, fish on fish uh, to the fisherman, which was around two million dollars, has gone eight folds. 
you know, it's become $16 million per annum from that owned. That was the conservation practice. That was the sustainable use practice that we intervened. So there are umpteen examples in this country uh, where, where we have seen that if proper valuation of an ecosystem service or a group of ecosystem services is done, uh, uh, you know, you know the, idea, the, the conservation practices will gain further impetus, and it is going to be a win-win kind of thing. Larger corpora corporations across the world, I don't think, is a problem. Problem is of small and medium scale, uh, you know, industries. And India being a, you know, uh, we, our manufacturing comes, almost half of our manufacturing comes from uh, small and uh, medium sector. The, this is the uh, area where we need to, you know, work. Uh, larger corporation doing voluntarily as part of CSR on conservation and sustainable use, I think this is not a challenge. So valuation has to be done for people in general and smaller and medium scale industries in particular. Thank you. Thank you so much, M. Pandey, for those really valuable examples of policy and business working together here in India. Ladies and gentlemen, we have some time for questions, so I'd like to open the floor for questions. Just to let you know what we're doing on timing, we're going to carry on this session until about five past three. We have two speakers on our panel that do need to go at three because of a flight, Ramesh and Richard. So what I would ask is if you have particular questions to them, if you could just uh, let us know first. Okay, that's great. We have one in the front. And just let us know your name and your organization and your question, please, sir. I think microphones are, are near you. Here we go. It's coming. It's coming. Uh, my name is Jay. I work with International Development Enterprises. Uh, we are in drip irrigation and uh, sustainable agriculture. Uh, I want to know from uh, Richard uh, that uh, when you have valued a certain uh, sector and said that the environmental cost and the natural cost is so much, uh, don't you think it is better to uh, value the risk that a company or a sector has? Like the, there was this example of the oil spill which happened and uh, BP had to pay a lot of money. The banker was not aware of this risk. So rather, because this valuation, however, they could be academically certified and there could be enough data to back it, it's not a direct cost to any power plant whether people are dying because of their pollution. Or to, suppose even if I drive a car, I'm causing deaths indirectly. But I'm not paying price for a single day of hospitalization of somebody who is suffering from. But if you can tell me uh, directly that using petrol directly, how does it impact me? Or how my risk profile changes in the near future or medium term? Uh, and uh, if you think this is a more uh, effective way, then uh, what valuation methods or what risk uh, measures, risk measurement measures are there to evaluate and this kind of thing? Thanks. Yeah, um, thanks. So the, um, there are many different levels of this valuation. This is quite a high level one, looking at various different regions and sectors and the scale of externalities. But um, the kind of work that we do quite often is much more specific, as you're pointing out. So, for example, we've done some work with Veolia, water company, looking at the, um, what would happen to your investment decision if you altered the net present value of two options, one which conserves water and one which is a business-as-usual solution that doesn't conserve as much water. If you, if you add it in, the price of water in the future at a certain level. So the assumption would be water is going to be priced according to its scarcity in this very specific location and this specific application. And what would happen to the net present value of these two projects and would that change your investment decision? So it's, it's increasingly used where you have trade-offs um, to, to th rethink how you might make those decisions. Rio Tinto, uh, for many of their mining assets are thinking this way as well. They're, they're altering the, or they have a, um, an alternative view of the potential value of the mine, the net present value of the mine, if you priced in water as an issue, water availability in particular, um, because it would actually change potentially the order in which you would exploit your reserves. So it can be very tangible. It's not just about um, 
uh, thinking about whether regulation might impose a risk on you. It's also thinking about whether um, a resource might reprice, might become repriced. And in fact, we're already finding this. So on average, there's been a 147% increase in um, commodity prices since the turn of the century. And quite a lot of that uh, could be caused, could be driven by changes in water availability as well as changes in demand, so change in supply. And quite a lot of that change in supply can be affected by things that previously were not priced that are becoming priced. So a lot of businesses are looking at those scenarios quite specifically and, and at a very localized basis. Thank you so much, Richard. We're going to have to let Richard and Ramesh go. But if there is, we have time for one more question, if you have a question for any other speakers on the panel. Yes, please. Thank you, madam. I am H. Kumar from Energy Media. I have a question to the renewable energy sector on a renewable energy. In the present context, renewable energy is a very good part in India, but adaptation in the climate change, adaptation maintenance is very lacking. So what should be more paradigm shifting for the adaptation of the renewable energies, climate change and renewables, like solar energy, wind energy, and a rural local area, those subsidies, subsidies are available, 30% subsidy is available, 5% interest loan is available, and other facilities are available, but they are not adapting in a proper way to make the climate change adaptation and a local area development as a thought. Yeah, uh, actually the problem is uh, that uh, renewable energy really does not require any subsidies. It is, if you remove the subsidies on oil and uh, coal, then you know you really don't need any subsidy for renewable energy. Uh, I was giving an example of what is happening in Sri Lanka and even in Pakistan, where there's no subsidy for fossil fuels. So there, you know, the cost of electricity, of course, goes up, but at the same time, you don't need these props to um, you know, help renewable energy even without the externalities. Actually speaking, with our resource constraint, we are in a very, very good position to leapfrog our technology and go to distributed generation because we have the technology. And, uh, you know, uh, why should we talk about these big uh, thermal and uh, fossil fuel power plants and send electricity to hundreds of kilometers away with all the line losses? Instead of that, we can have distributed generation in a more efficient way if these subsidy skew is removed. So, so then you'll have the adaptation automatically. Thank you, Ramesh. It's a great example for if you internalize those externality costs, you would see the benefits in that. So ladies and gentlemen, just to close this session, my key takeaways were that the business case for valuing natural capital is absolutely on the increase. We've heard some amazing examples that are happening here in India, that are happening internationally, of the policy mechanisms that are already moving into place. And particularly for you businesses in the audience, MR has laid out a challenge and an opportunity for you for WEF and Davos 2014. If you would like to join as part of this wider call for action on natural capital, he would like very much to hear from you. So if you could please join me in thanking our panelists and thank you all for your interventions also. Thank you.